that, we get this all going. Uh, this today we, uh, here at uh, two thirty, we are we are uh, welcoming Tony Wolf uh, to do illustrating and drawing web comics. Um, Tony Wolf has written and illustrated four comic journalism pieces for the New York Times in the last several years. He has also written and drawn auto bio comics and history comics, highlighted in the New York Times Magazine, The New Statesman. Gothamist and other comics websites. He is a native of Long Island. He is also an actor and singer. You can find more information about Tony at www.tonywolfactor.com and it, on Instagram or Twitter at Tony Wolfness. And with that, on to him. Hey, thank you, Frank. Okay. And thank you everyone for attending and joining our session today. Uh, I would presume that perhaps some of you who are attending have an interest in making comics. Maybe you are comics readers who always wanted to make your own comic, or maybe you are already starting to draw and, and write and draw your own stories, crafting your own comic books, and maybe you're just looking for tips. And uh, maybe you never had interest in making comics and just stumbled into this. And so I'll try to give uh, a presentation that could meet everyone's needs and just give you a little insight and a window into how I do this, this weird, crazy, odd thing, which is making comics. Uh, I can tell you that I am a lifelong comic book reader I was always very, <clears throat> very into cartoons, comic books. I think a lot of people who love comics, they have what I jokingly call their gateway drug, right? What got you into comics? And actually the same could hold true for animation and cartoons in the sense of animated cartoons. I'm not an animator myself, but I was also a big fan of cartoons growing up. You know, a lot of kids are, you, you know, your parents turn on the cartoons and you watch, you love the cartoons, whatever the cartoons are. And I think that reading comics and comic books as a kid and also watching cartoons because they are all drawings, they are all visual, they are cartoony, most animated series. It just really impressed upon me the language, the visual language of comics. And I think for me, my first gateway comics were definitely uh, Peanuts, Charlie Brown. You know, we're going very young now in terms of what were you reading when you were quite small in terms of comics. Probably Garfield for me uh, because I'm older. So I'm, I'm gonna access some 80s, 1980s uh, comics and cartoons. And I think Archie was definitely, you know, Archie Digests. They used to be on sale as sort of an impulse item in supermarkets. And I would go shopping with my mother. She would take me when I was quite small to the supermarket. And it was, oh, well, here's something to keep the kid occupied. DC Comics and Marvel back then also did publish very small digest size collections of their superhero comic books. So I remember uh, my mother bought for me a very small digest size collection of Spider-Man's first eight issues, the Stanley and Steve Ditko Spider-Man. I was given, you know, a collection of some DC comics, Superman, Legion of Superheroes. But I think for me as a young child, Peanuts and Garfield probably, but especially Peanuts were one of the formative uh, influences. And then as I got older, I really started getting into superhero comics, of course, and then as a teenager, I began to discover what I would call the indie comics, you know, like indie film, the more independent comics, which usually were not about superheroes, but sometimes they were. And a lot of those indie comics would have been about autobiographical comics or just more realistic comic stories that had nothing fantastical about them. I started drawing from a very young age. I think one one trait of illustrators, and I'm also an actor, right? So there's a double obs obsessiveness there. Um, actors, illustrators, I would put musicians in this category, painters, writers, journalists, they're all a little bit obsessive, right? We have an interest that we are passionate about, and it doesn't have to be these things. You could be a photographer, you could be a teacher, 
anything really. You could be a business person or, not, or an entrepreneur. Most of the people in life, if we have a skill and an enthusiasm for a certain field, whether it's sports, comics, movies, uh, writing, uh, anything, any kind of athleticism or intellectual uh, scholarly pursuits, they come out of obsession. They're born of a passionate interest that you have that's a little stronger than your interest in perhaps some other things. So I was drawing quite a bit. I like drawing, you know, uh, and I spent a lot of time drawing. I think a lot of people who are good painters, good illustrators, the reality is it's a solitary task, right? It's a solitary profession. So one ingredient you will need to make your comic and to become proficient at drawing at all is time, free time, hopefully without distractions. Uh, I think, you know, I grew up without the internet, without cell phones, and that left a kid like me in the late 1970s and early 80s with a lot of free time. And so I was a big reader of books. I read a lot of prose books, also read a lot of comics. And I probably uh, played a lot of Atari. I was a video game kid and Atari was, was what we had then, or ColecoVision. And, uh, you know, I watched cartoons and I watched TV. But um, art is something you get good at by spending many hours alone. I mean, or with friends, if you're all, you know, you can draw in the company of other people, certainly. But it's a pretty solitary task. So I wanted to start off this presentation just for fun by uh, sharing, I'll share my screen in a moment. And what I wanted to do was, I thought it might be fun to show you some of the, my mother was actually very kind and saved drawings that I made when I was quite young. And, you know, sometimes our parents save the, the little toys and, and, you know, here I made you a, a ceramic, you know, whatever it is from childhood. Well, I'm very thankful that my mom saved these. And uh, I can show you um, some of them here. So let's, and by the way, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to type them in the uh, chat program and we can uh, address them as we go. So I'm gonna share screen. And again, thank you for uh, coming here today going to share a screen and I've queued up something on my, I have, you know, uh, people don't really use the albums feature in Facebook all that much anymore, it seems, but I've kept an album that I call drawings from when I was very small. So these are drawings from very young, uh, you know, Batman and Robin. And this was to G and G that was to grandma and grandpa, you know, basically, you know, like kids make things for their parents or their relatives. Um, let's see, that's the Hulk <laughs> I drew when I was eight, eight years old. Um, oh, Superman, the first Christopher Reeve Superman movie came out when I was eight or nine years old. And I was big into superheroes, big into Superman. And I bought a, uh, a poster book full of, full of images from the movie. So this is me trying to draw for my grandparents. But obviously, I don't think my grandparents cared much about Superman. I think they just, uh, you know, were, were pleased with any drawings their, their grandchild gave them. But here's Superman, and I, I was always interested in lettering. And lettering is a big aspect of comics if you do your own hand lettering. And so even at this young age, I was very obsessive about trying to, you see, I'm trying to do the dimensions here that the, uh, the three-dimensional aspect of the S in Superman that the, that the film gave it. Um, this is me drawing a Sal Buscema Hulk cover uh, from Marvel Comics in 81. I was born in 1971, so I'm 10 years old there. And you can see evidence that uh, I'm very obsessed with trying to capture the, uh, the shading and the musculature that the real Marvel Comics artist did, whose name is Sal Buscema. Uh, I watched a lot of Six Million Dollar Man, 
who really was a superhero for the 1970s, uh, even though we might not commonly think of him as a superhero. And, you know, big into dinosaurs, like a lot of kids were. Here's a brontosaurus. And I'm working on my lettering, as you can see. I probably mis misspelled some things. The ankylosaurus. I gave him a little bit of a human face. Um, R2-D2, because I was an enormous, and still am, Star Wars fan. So that's my probably nine-year-old attempt to draw R2-D2. Oh, uh, King Kong, I was a big fan of King Kong, and there's a King Kong movie some of you may have heard of called Mighty, well, it's not a King Kong movie, it's sort of a King Kong ripoff, but there's a film called Mighty Joe Young, which is basically a King Kong ripoff, and uh, I was fascinated with this movie. So here's, uh, he's another giant gorilla, just like King Kong. He's unrelated to King Kong, he's not King Kong's son, he's just a ripoff, and I, I thought that movie was as cool as King Kong. I actually made, when I was eight years old, I guess, my own King Kong comic book, which I, you can see I clumsily uh, taped together. See, the great thing about comics, as this presentation is about making comics, there's nothing to stop you from making a comic, like right now. Um, you don't need to be published by Marvel or DC to make a comic. Anytime you sit down and draw a comic with a pen, and a piece of paper or a pencil, you've made a comic. Brian Bendis, who's very uh, successful comic book writer, he's written for Marvel and DC, The Avengers, Spider-Man, Daredevil, and now he's writing Superman. He has a famous quote, which I wanna share. And Bendis's quote is, if you wanna break into comics, all you have to do is make a comic. There, You've made it, you've broke it into comics. Now, of course, people that are making comics with the aim of being professionally published and eventually one day getting published by a very prominent large publisher, they're aiming for a different goal. They're aiming very high. But the beauty is, and honestly, the comics that I make, you can just make comics on your own. Um, there's the cover of book two of King Kong. Uh, this is a comic I made. This is the very beginning of my King Kong comic made at age nine or something. One of the great things about comics, you don't have to be a good artist, quote, quote. There is a web comic called The Oatmeal, which is massively successful. And I believe the creator uh, lives solely on the income from The Oatmeal. And, uh, that comic is mostly stick figures. Uh, is anyone, any of you familiar with the oatmeal? Anyone here in our, in our chat? Oh, sorry, I just screwed up the screen share there. Um, well, let us know. The oatmeal, that guy is not drawing detailed figures. He is not drawing uh, incredibly detailed work. He is drawing essentially stick figures. I would say they're more, a little more than glorified stick figures, but his sense of design in terms of where to lay things out on the page is very good. And he is a great and extremely clever writer. So here's a comic. I mean, I was eight, but you know, this could be someone's beginner comic at any age, really. You have some lettering, you tell us the establishing shot. Comics are a lot like movies. And if you're a first time comics creator, it can help you to think of a comic as a movie and particularly as a film storyboard, right? So in most movies or TV shows or cartoons, you have what we call an establishing shot that says, where are we? Where does this adventure, where does this scene take place? So, and you have a caption, you know, you have your lettering, uh, Skull Island. And here's my very clumsily drawn silhouette of an island, an isolated island in the Pacific <laughs> um, with some clouds. And now what, what happens on this island? Well, they're giant monsters and they fight because that's what kids want and that's what I wanted. One monster triumphs over the other. Here's some use of sound effects as the monsters are roaring. 
And now in the next panel, I'm changing locations like a film or TV would. And now we're in New York City somewhere. And there's some scientists that are going to, uh, they're issuing orders that a bunch of scientists are getting into their, you know, plane or hovercraft vehicle, whatever this thing I've drawn is. And they want to explore Skull Island. So Skull Island has obviously come into the awareness of, um, you know, some scientists that are curious about it. So comics really are simply, um, this is a larger page here. Here's another page. You could just start off by drawing a bunch of squares. And we call these panels, each little square that tells a brief scene in a comic is called a panel. And uh, you can fit as many or as few panels onto a page as you wish. And it's just telling the story. Now the main thing for comics in general, and soon I'll, I'll take us away from my childhood drawings and onto some professional drawings. I tried to draw here, this is King Kong versus Godzilla, by the way, because we all love to see them fight. So here's King Kong picking up an unconscious or dazed Godzilla and throwing him very far. He can throw him very far because he is super strong. He is King Kong. So did I choose great camera angles here as a kid? No, but it does convey that he's picking up uh, an unconscious Godzilla <laughs> and that he's throwing him, right? I'm using the, uh, the real life effect that when, when something is far away, like a plane high in the air, it is very small, right? So, and I've got the arms extended to show that he's throwing Godzilla. He's telling Godzilla to take a hike. Here's a Star Trek parody I did because I, I watched a lot of Dr. Demento um, and uh, watched a lot of Star Trek. And I read a lot of Mad Magazine and Weird Al Yankovic songs uh, listened to. So here's my, uh, you know, Star Trek parody, Star Black, 1979. So I was eight years old then too. I think this is one of my youngest drawings. I was maybe five or six and I'm drawing Spider-Man and I'm very, trying very hard to adhere to the colors. Uh, misspelled Loch Ness Monster, but I've always loved monsters like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, yeah, oh, this is a very young, I'm probably five there, draw, drawing Spider-Man at age five. So let's bring you to some other, uh, some other drawings that are more recent. I did a comic recently uh, for the New York Times, which I'd been working on for quite a while. And every comic that you make will begin with a layout, what comic artists also call a thumbnail. Thumbnail is just another word for a layout. And all a layout means is that you are scribbling things on a piece of paper, planning out what your comic might look like, excuse me, in advance before you begin to draw it in like final form. So when I started this comic, I didn't know what the rest of the comic would be, but it's a realistic comic, it's a real story, and it's about a beloved pizzeria in my neighborhood which was in Greenpoint, Brooklyn at the time. And all I knew, I had this image, comics like movies or a lot of other things like painting, it all starts with imagination. It all starts with an image that pops into your head that if you're an artist, you might want, oh, you're like, ooh, I wanna draw that. I just got this idea. I see it in my head or something close to it. I feel like I wanna draw that rather than just let it live in my head and not uh, bring it to fruition. So all I knew is that I wanted to uh, start with an establishing shot, a front on camera angle of the pizzeria as it appeared if you were standing in the center of the street or if you were standing at the edge of the sidewalk. And when I make my comics, I don't really write a script. You can write a script like a movie script first, right? To write out your comic in prose only, in lettering only. But it helps me because you only have a certain limited amount of space on the page for your comic. You only have a certain limited amount of space on the page for the lettering that is going to accompany your drawings. So I always find it helpful to start scribbling down lettering and, and things I want to write and captions, narrative captions, 
and where they might fit on the page. This down below here in the latter half of the page is an early super thumbnail crappy drawing layout of what eventually became the second page of this story. And it, it's interesting, I haven't looked at this in a while. This image of a close up of this bearded guy's face, I did end up using that in the second page, but I ended up laying out the page differently, right? So it wasn't one big rectangle up here and two small rectangles here that contained the artwork. I can show you, let's show you real quickly. So if you look at this, you see this first page here and this second page here. I have here, this is the eventual completed first page, right? All the lettering done in final, all the artwork done in final. And this one in particular, this particular page ended up looking quite like what I drew in my scribbled thumbnail. And I've also had this colored by my colorist, a guy who's an excellent colorist whose name is Tom Griffin. So uh, he colors the book under my sort of art direction uh, supervision. Now, I think somewhere, do I have here, I could bring it up uh, in the future, but yeah, I don't quite have the second page here, but the other thing I did, now let's say you want your comic to be a little more realistic and less cartoony. I, I looked at a lot of reference photos of this guy. There is no shame in using photo reference. I, I personally think you don't wanna be tracing your photo reference, but there's no shame if you're doing a comic about real people or that involves real locations. There is no shame in being a photographer, being a photojournalist. I snapped a lot of pictures of this guy because I knew I wanted them to look like real body language and real poses and not just be made up all of, off the top of my head. No matter how good an artist you are, um, you will probably only be able to draw so many things off the top of your head, right? Without looking at photo reference, without looking at body language um, and various things like that. At one point, uh, yeah, I was going to draw beef patties. And so I researched, you know, the logo of the company. At one point in the comic, I thought I might incorporate the logo of this company that made these beloved beef patties that I liked. But I really wanted to look at how do you draw a beef patty? All right, it's got these crinkly things on the edges. Like a, like a dumpling to some degree, right? Anyway, so I'm gonna stop sharing now, um, just for a moment. First of all, was there a question in the chat? Let's see. Ah, thank you, right? The oatmeal. So actually, let's, let's resume screen sharing and let's look at the oatmeal. Just real quickly. And once again, feel free, anyone who is curious or has questions who's attending, um, let's look at the oatmeal. Now, when we look at the oatmeal, what the oatmeal is and why, is it, why it's a success, and I've given a number of talks about comics over the years, and I always like to cite the oatmeal. Why? It is very funny, but the art is extremely simple. So some people might come to me or have come to me in the past and they'll say, well, Tony, I want to make my own comics, but I'm not an experienced illustrator. And I say, you don't need to be. Look at this first one. I'm increasing the size for you all. This is funny. It's just cute. It's interesting. It's relatable. It's, you know, there's a bunny and a, a Grim Reaper, a Jawa. I'm not quite sure what that is, but, you know, Boredom and overeating. It's a fridge. It's a very simple drawing of a fridge and a person who's just bored and eating. Um, when I die. I mean, I believe that's the first panel of a larger comic. But once again, look at how simply that bird is drawn. You could draw a bird that is more cartoony and more simple than that bird. And we, the audience and the readers, we would know that it's a bird. Look at how simply these waves are drawn without any of the fancy coloring. You can just draw some waves and the suggestion of a sun and we get it. There is a bird, maybe it's a seagull flying over the waves. Look at this house on fire. 
a, a very simplistically drawn house, very simplistically drawn firemen, very simplistically drawn bushes. Yet we all immediately, we look at this image in one glance and we get it, you know. Here's a guy drawn kind of like an egg, you know, an egg shaped guy on his computer. Look at how few lines are used in drawing. And also he has a thing here about creativity. This is a whole essay that he wrote and illustrated, which is really a really terrific essay. But I just wanna say this, your comic can really be whatever you want it to be. There's no rule. And actually comics are uh, pretty incredible in that in some ways a comic, I call them the great equalizer. You don't need your comic to follow anyone else's rules. If you wanna make a comic about your pet snake having adventures and he becomes friends with the dog that lives down the street, do it. It's a comic, it's drawings on paper. If you wanna make a comic about two particles of dust and one particle of dust has a personality and that plays off the other particle of dust personality, do it. Like that's a fun, weird idea. I just made that up now, but it's like, it can literally be anything. Your comic can be like your diary. There's an entire world of comics that are autobio. And the only reason I ended up getting into the New York Times is I started doing autobio comics on my own that were not published by anyone that I just put on a blog. And this brings me to another uh, key element of comics. The world of comics today and web comics is radically different than when I was younger. When I was younger, the only way to get your comic published was a real big deal publisher somehow taking notice of you and, and publishing your book. But now with the internet, as you know, anyone can make a web comic, anyone. And I had no, I mean, I was a comic book fan and I knew people who worked at comic book stores, but I didn't have any contacts really among professionals. Um, there was a couple illustrators that I knew who were professionals who would occasionally see my drawings and encourage me. They were like, come on, you should do comics. And I was like, uh. and also here's the other thing. I did not think of myself as a writer. I didn't. I thought I'm an actor. I can draw decently, but I don't think I'm a good writer. And many years uh, worth of friends said to me, you write essays okay, and you like language and your emails are way too long. You're obviously like writing. <laughs> uh, I'm very verbose, as you can tell, and I write a lot of emails and you know I can dash off eight paragraphs in, in 12 minutes. So they said, you can write. And they really pushed me. They said, don't give up on yourself. I know it might sound cheesy or cliche, but and eventually I said, well, if I'm not a fiction writer, if I'm not gonna write fiction at this time because I don't have any ideas that I thought were worth doing, there is that whole world of autobio comics where you just make comics about your life. And I began to say to myself, well, maybe I could just write comics about my life. And so then, and this is what I would advise you, any of you who are watching this or who might watch it after it was recorded, if any, if any part of you, any bone in your body or any part of your soul or your mind ever wanted to make a comic or ever wanted to be a writer or write something, one of the exercises that I gave myself, and I don't mean an exercise like from a workbook, I said to myself, well, I, a lot of stories we, that happen to us in our lives might not be interesting, right? But I thought to myself, what are the funny stories from my life? And they don't have to be funny. They could be touching or serious. What are the anecdotes from my life that when, I, when I've told them at a party, people really seem to like be like, ooh, that one was interesting. Like the other six stories you told Tony were sort of boring and we, we could joke about that. And yes, I know they're boring. But 
what are the, the few, you know, because we all have stories that we tell, right, to our friends uh, at a party. And sometimes, because we're human beings, we might return to telling the same stories over and over to different people over time. Like we have our favorite stories. Oh, this crazy thing happened to me eight years ago. This guy came up to me in a clown costume and he, he said this thing to me and then I ended up, you know, going to a party that he was a clown at. You know, it was all very spontaneous and weird and that didn't happen to me. But all of you who are listening to this or watching this, you all have some interesting stories, real life interesting stories that happen to you, right? So what if you took the one that people in your life that have consistently found the most interesting, what if you took your top two stories and made each of those a comic? Each of those could be a comic book. And I wanna say this, your comic could be short. Your comic could be a short story. It could be two pages. It could be one page. It could be five or four pages. They don't need to be long. And actually, look, I'm not, I don't work for Marvel or DC, but I've been published by, you know, a couple newspapers, not, not consistently. It's not like I'm some big deal person, but I made a lot of short stories. And eventually those stories started resonating with people. And now I am a comic guy, although it's so funny. Sometimes I'm sort of like, really, am I a comic? You know, like, did I make these? Like, I don't, you know, it feels a little surreal. But the point is, they can be short. The first comics that I did were, I did a five-page one. Then I did a six-page one. Uh, since then, I've done like a lot of two-page stories. They don't have to be long. When I first started out, I thought, oh, it's got to be 24 pages like a Marvel comic. It's got to be 24 pages like a DC comic that you would pick up at the store or at the 7-Eleven. It doesn't. And a lot of that is because of web comics. Your comic can be any length you want. It can be about anything you want. It can be in any format you want. It can be in color. It can be in black and white. You can do digital lettering or hand lettering. And it can be literally about anything you imagine. Real, fake, fiction, crazy, surreal, you know, unicorns, David Lynch, Twin Peaks, like David Lynch, you know, Fox Mulder fan fiction, you know, Twin Peaks level insanity. You know, that, that very surreal TV show, Twin Peaks, if you're familiar with it. Um, there's a comics creator who said, uh, Comics are infinite, you know, they're infinite. It can be, and your page, by the way, remember how I said they're broken up into panels? Um, your page, you can do those panels however you want. This is a little sample. Here's one sample, right? Panel one, a big one, makes a splash. Sometimes it's called a splash page or a splash image. Panel, and then your story goes, panel two, panel three, panel four, your page can look like that, right? And then you put your drawings and your, your lettering inside, or it could be this. It could be like a newspaper cartoon strip where it's four things horizontally. And I'm doing this backwards, of course, because it's the screen. One, two, three, four. Now, one thing I wanted to say, not all of your panels need to have borders. We call this, this rec, sorry, this rectangle, we call that a, a border. It is a border to a panel, so we call it a panel border. But sometimes it's kind of cool to change it up and do a panel where the characters are there and your background is there, but there's no border. And what that does psychologically is it gives that panel a sense of breathing more. And it might contribute to the tone. Oh, it's upside down. Did I screw that up? Oh, hey, Tony does not know Zoom so well. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I love it. One, two, three, four. And wait, was my other one upside down too? No, that looks sort of right. Okay. <laughs> right? Um, I did, I scribbled a little thing. Thank you. <laughs> I did a little thing before 
this class where I um, where I, I drew I drew this panel real simple, right? This is a panel that I scribbled. Let's see if it's coming through. Can you see that? Does it look as pixelated as it does for me? I don't know. Um, it's a guy. It's a guy sitting at a desk. One, one version of it has a panel border, right? And the other one doesn't. And I think, I mean, this is all very arbitrary, right? Because it's the arts, it's artsy. It is all arbitrary, and that's part of the, the beauty of it. But I think that second panel, I would submit to you. I would submit to the court. I would submit to you that the second panel has a different tone to it, a slightly different emotional tone. Even though there is no dialogue, even though there is no lettering at all, there's no narrative caption. The second one, because there is no border, it almost feels maybe a little more melancholy than the first panel. It almost feels a little more open-ended and open to interpretation because it literally does not, it is open-ended literally and metaphorically. It has no border. And maybe you might envision that character sort of uh, having a more airy or thoughtful or contemplative disposition and emotional state. So I just wanted to show that as an example. Your panels and the way you shape them that has a tremendous impact on the emotional tone of your story and what the subconscious elements of your artwork and your layouts convey. So um, I could oh, I'll also show you. So for those of you who don't make comics regularly, whenever you make a comic, you start out you could start out drawing it in pen. If you have an idea what you want to write, you could just start in pen, in ink, right? But most comics uh, creators will start drawing it in pencil first, just so they have like a foundation. It's like, you don't build the house, you know, you don't just bring your, your wood and your pipes and your electricity and build the house without making a blueprint, right? Most things in life, you have a foundational blueprint. And for comics, you know, if you're gonna design a chair, if you're a furniture designer, you need to sketch out what your chair is gonna look like before you hand it to the, the artisans and the construction workers and the carpenters that are gonna make and mass produce your chair. So for comics, that understructure, the, uh, the blueprint is uh, your pencils. And actually, I found an example of a comic that I started to draw at a comics convention. I, this is not a comic, rather. I'm sorry. This is a one drawing. I saw a drawing of Jack Kirby's Doctor Doom, one of the iconic villains in comics. And it was a Jack Kirby panel. And I thought, I'm bored. I'm here at this convention. No one's at my table. No one's coming over to buy my comics at this small indie comics convention that I was at about three years ago. I'm just going to draw. That's one of the tips. If you're a comics creator and you're at a convention and it's, you know, you're sort of bored, nothing is really happening. People are not coming up to your table. Um, you've already looked at other people's tables and supported your fellow artists. You can just draw. So I started this and I, I never finished it. So you're going to see a drawing that is like in several stages, right? Now it's funny. I didn't draw this exactly the way Kirby did it. Jack Kirby, of course, King, King Kirby of comics. But that's another thing, you're drawing, if you're drawing like an homage drawing or just a practice thing you felt like drawing for fun, it doesn't need to look like, you don't have to get it right. It's up to you how much you want it to look exactly like the original. You know, don't be hard on yourself. So here you see that half of it is in pencil. You know, his hand, his other hand, they're in pencil. And the other half is inked. And even if I show you close up, I didn't ink his eyes yet. So you see the eyes are in pencil and you see the various inking effects I've done. By the way, people ask about tools. All I use is simple markers. There's nothing fancy. 
you can use a brush if you wish, but that is a little more, uh, that requires some more finesse and some more uh, practice. I use pens called Microns. They're pretty well known among illustrators. Even if you don't know them, you can uh, just go to an art store and ask, where are the Microns? Microns are awesome because, in fact, I can even show you. Hold on one second. I got a lot of them right here. Um, just to show you what these pens look like. Micron, they're in different thicknesses and sizes. Uh, they have the number of the size of like the pen nib width on the front. And you see, it might be backwards or upside down, but it says Micron. Micron 05. Now that means the pen nib, right? The width of your, think of it like a pencil, right? Do you have a thin pencil tip or do you have a very thick pencil? Five is good for lettering and good for like medium, medium thickness outlines and stuff. Um, and you know, I just got a bunch of these pens. So I'm not using any expensive or fancy. Every comic I did for the New York Times was drawn with regular boring old pencils and uh, these microns. You know, if you need to fill in a thick black area, you just get a big old thick black Sharpie or some kind of big old thick black marker like you see when, when you're, you're shipping something in the mail and you need a really thick Sharpie, it's like real big so your letters come out nice and big. Um, so the comics can really be anything. They can be anything you want them to be. Um, let me see if I have, I had some other examples queued up here of like, your comics can be, this is black and white. But for an example, I mean, this was done in color, but I printed it out in black and white. This was from a comic I did about Batman and Robin when, when readers voted to kill Robin in the Batman comics. And this is just, um, I realize I could bring this up on the screen too, but somehow it's more fun for me to show it to you. You know, it's three panels um, with a narrative caption. And I did a trick here with a narrative caption is you notice how the narrative caption is extended over all three panels. And I did that as a kind of a subconscious effect to let you know that the narrative caption would almost function like a voiceover of a documentary. That the ideas expressed in that narrative caption at the top were like an umbrella narrative caption. And what I mean is, those would narrate all three panels simultaneously. And therefore the information in each panel contained under that caption um, were like thematically, you know, under the heading of that narrative caption. Um, and also forget comics, let's be honest. Sometimes drawing is just fun. Sometimes you just wanna draw things cause you wanna draw them cause they're fun. It doesn't have to tell a story. Um, sometimes you just, you build up your practice as an illustrator through just drawing. And to be honest, anything you are genuinely inspired to draw is worth drawing. And I'll say that again. Anything you are excited about drawing is worth drawing. And I'll also be very honest. Sometimes I'm not always in the mood to draw. Sometimes I'm tired. I just want to veg out and watch movies and binge on TV shows. But there is an element where if we're, if we're moderately serious about drawing, even if we don't want to be professional, right? Even if you just want to improve your skills to draw, it does require practice, right? Uh, I used to play piano a little bit. I play piano a tiny bit now, but my skills have gotten very rusty because I haven't played piano in 10 years. So I force myself to draw at least every three or four days, sometimes more than that. But if I have gone four days or five days without drawing, I sort of like jokingly sort of slap myself on the wrist and I say, hey, it's time to draw. And the way I motivate myself is I draw stuff for fun. It doesn't have to be a story. It doesn't have to be something I'm gonna pitch to the New York Times or any blog or anything. One time, a bunch of years ago, I drew Godzilla just because I wanted to draw Godzilla. I Googled a bunch of pictures of Godzilla. I found a, a, an image of him that I liked that I, that I didn't think was like a cliche. You know, there's a lot of Godzilla pictures that we've seen a million times. 
I try to find the less, the less overplayed song photos, if that makes sense. And I just drew Godzilla. And I, I thought, you know what? I was trying to play with like a graphic design background. What if he had these totally unrealistic, like we call these emphasis lines in comics. Like they look like a visual shock, right? Uh, I don't mean that there's lightning hitting Godzilla, although you could interpret it that way. I just mean it's sort of a visual emphasis line that is not supposed to be realistic. And I, I just wanted them to be big and clunky and like very graphic design influenced. So I drew Godzilla. Like it just made me happy to draw Godzilla. You know, like there's a restaurant that was in my neighborhood in Brooklyn that I loved, a French restaurant called Sauvage. Like it's savage, but it's French, Sauvage. And uh, I also was trying to like, I was trying to show some editors at magazines that I could draw like just illustrations that were not comics, right? Like magazine illustration. And I was hoping that maybe some fancy food magazines might hire me to draw for them. It has not happened yet, but <laughs> uh, so I just, I, I had photos of this restaurant that I took myself and I just drew the photo. I sent it to them. I think they might've put it on their Instagram, like it's fan art of their restaurant. But I just really, I just wanted to give myself the challenge of drawing this restaurant. Um, it's not a comic. It's not a sequential image, right? I just felt like drawing, uh, you know, I just felt like drawing a restaurant. The reality is drawing, look, it's work, but it also should be fun. You know, musicians who are successful musicians, it's fun for them. I'm also an actor. It's fun for me to act. Um, you should really uh, draw because you like it. Draw because it's, it's entertaining for you. It is a fun way to occupy your time. And once again, it should be a little bit of a passion. I'm not saying you, you need to want to make it your entire life forever, but you know, it's art. Art is supposed to be fun and born out of um, enthusiasm. So I've blathered on for quite a while. Anyone, I don't know, anyone have questions or thoughts or, I mean, I can, I can, I can go on to other topics for a little bit longer, but I'm just curious. Anyone, anyone here, uh, I don't know, make comics or have questions about comics? Feel free. And feel free to ask in the chat or unmute yourself if you want to ask live. Yeah, I, I would say definitely unmute yourself if you want to pop in. And Michael, thank you for attending. Michael is a, a, a friend through, through the interwebs. I, I appreciate it, Michael. And I, I thank you for clarifying, Michael, earlier that uh, my thing was upside down. That was very helpful, actually, because I had no idea it was upside down. Um, you know, I ended up doing um, some sort of like storyboards for some advertising agencies, like advertising agencies, pitches, you know, this was a weird, well, it's, 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 uh, they were like, we want to draw, like, can you draw like superhero kind of hands? And they're each shooting a laser and each laser represents like a concept. Like one laser is design and one laser is ideas and one laser is measurement. And I'm, okay, sure. You're paying me to draw. <laughs> you know, so, um, it's just fun to draw like the weird explosion of ideas at the top. Um, uh, and I will say this, um, when I write my own comics and illustrate my own comics, um, you try to, at least I try to look, it is true. Sometimes you can really defeat yourself, right? Sometimes you can get depressed and say, why do a comic? Why tell a story? It's all been done before. What do I have to do that, what could I contribute that would be special, right? All these people, they're better than me. They've been doing this longer than me. I'm not a writer. I, I literally, I still have to like pinch myself and be like, I am a writer. I have to force myself to say I am a writer because I didn't think I was. I knew I could write essays passably, but I thought comics are not essays. It needs to be a story. So basically I try to turn a weakness into a strength 
my, my first few comics, they are kind of essays. They are, um, they're like diary entries. They're like reflections. Um, and most filmmakers, I would draw this analogy, most filmmakers are influenced by the films they love. Most novelists are influenced by the writers they love. I was influenced by the, by the writing and the comics that I love. So I thought, I like comics that are kind of reflective. And my comics are kind of like my train of thought. They're kind of like my stream of consciousness. And so with my, and I enjoy comics that, I mean, I enjoy all kinds of comics, but I enjoy comics that are like, I have a quirky stream of consciousness. My thoughts are weird. And the way I jump from topic to topic is weird. But I'd like to tell a story where I take you through my thoughts. And as long as I think that there is a central theme or a through line, right? Like a snake winding through the grass, we are making a point here. There is a point I want to make. You, you ever have that friend that his stories kind of ramble on, but they actually sort of make sense? <laughs> like his stories kind of, they seem like they go, oh, by the way, they're like, they jump from topic to topic, yet you sense there is like an overall arching narrative and you're entertained as a friend when you listen to that friend's stories. That's what I tried to um, do with my stories. And then the next time around, I'll be like, all right, let me try to make this a little less of a rambling narrative. And let me try to make this story a little more focused, right? Basically the beauty, it's your playground. When a musician writes a song, it's their playground. Elvis Costello sat down to write a song. I love Elvis Costello. And he was like, I want to write a song that sounds like a, uh, a George Jones country song. And he, he had obviously studied George Jones's songs enough that he could be like, his chord structure is like this and his lyrical structure is like this. And the song tends to feel like this. And Elvis Costello has enough talent and ability that he's like, what if I did my version of that style of piece? And he did. And honestly, a lot of the great films that we love, it's Steven Spielberg going, what if I did my version of this action movie that I loved 10 years ago? Or Martin Scorsese being like, I don't see enough stories being told about my Italian neighborhood and the people that I see there. You know, a lot of it is just trying to tell stories about your life or your people, right? The people in your social circles, the people in your orbit and the people that you might encounter. And another thing that I always try to focus on, if you see that you have an idea for a story and you think the people or the populations that that story are about, if you don't think you see stories about them very often, that's a good indicator that you should tell that story, right? Or I did a comic about the McRib. I'm like, this is a dumb idea. I know it's silly. I know it's duh uh um It is dumb with a capital D. But I freaking love the McRib. And I have a whole story that I like to tell people at parties about my undying passion for the McRib. And I, it might have been my girlfriend that was like, what if you make that into a comic? And I was like, oh, it actually could be a comic. It be, it's silly. It's dumb. But there's no doubt that I've never seen a comic about the McRib before. So it's sort of like, you know, sometimes a hit song becomes a hit song because it's about a topic that hasn't been beaten to death. Or if it is a love song, a genre that has been well covered, it has a new angle on the love song and it spins that tale in a different way, right? So your job as a storyteller, if you choose to accept it, as the old Mission Impossible thing went, is, look, we've all heard there's only seven stories, or there's only, you know, there's only a few plots. Fine, sure, but it's your challenge, and it's your exciting creative risk if you want to dive into that pool. You can always put a new spin on that story. You can always tell that story, and then it twists a little bit. Or maybe it doesn't twist at all, but the way you tell it and your individual voice as a storyteller, the way you lay it out, the way you write it, 
the tone with which you write it matters a lot. Um, it's infinite. It's endless. I still read tons of autobiocomics from people both famous and, and obscure, and they're so good and they're so exciting. You know, there's a lot of friends and acquaintances and, and strangers I know who are parents, right? They have young children and they make comics. And even though they could say to themselves, um, they could say to themselves, oh, there's too many comics. There's too many jokes about parents and all the problems and challenges of having kids and parents and the, the funny things kids say and the funny things parents say. That doesn't stop them though, because they know that they have unique things to contribute. A lot of it is just taking a leap of faith that you have a unique voice. Um, everyone who's here, you know, uh, I see Duan, Chandramuli, Michael, Wael. You have, life, you have life experiences that I don't know about, that I haven't heard about. And uh, maybe it's time for you to tell them. And even if your comic is stick figures, if you think the writing is either interesting, touching, clever, poignant, uh, amusing, educational, you know, teaches uh, people about something they don't know about. I did that comic about the McRib and this other comic I did, which ended up in the New York Times about the Tartufo, which is this Italian ice cream. These were just obscure, weird things. And I thought, I want to make the definitive history of this weird topic. So even if it was some obscure comic that just was on a small blog or something, someone on the planet, the great thing about the internet is someone on the planet's gonna discover your thing. Even if it's on a small blog, someone on the planet can discover your thing, right? Through social media or whatever, and be like, oh, there's a guy, there's an Instagram account if you guys are really into comics, I'll show you this. I don't know this guy, but he's fascinating to me. He has an account on Instagram called Chad in Amsterdam. Let me bring this up for you. Chad in Amsterdam. I'm going to share a screen. This is a really talented comics artist, writer, and creator. Sometimes he writes and draws his own stories, and sometimes he, uh, other people illustrate stories that he writes. Let's do it. Chad in Amsterdam. This is a US citizen who lives in Amsterdam. His comics are fascinating. Um, he draws like I think, yeah, this is him. Um, he has a lot of other people drawing his stories. So you don't even have to write and draw your own story, right? You could write the script, which might look like a screenplay. And in this case, for this short story, he's hired a uh, Rochelle Meyer, another wonderful illustrator, to draw his story about his life. So it's about him, it's an anecdote from his life, but he's hired a different artist to illustrate it. Much like a, a writer writes a screenplay and actors act it out. So look at this. I mean, the beauty thing is, uh, when artists draw a person, it doesn't have to look exactly like the person. It just has to be recognizable. Right? They're talking about he lives in a canal. Look at how beautiful and simple that is. I mean, I don't mean that the drawing is simple. The drawing is very complex and detailed, right? But look at how elegant and I don't want to say sentimental because that word has become negative, but it's sort of poignant. It's like, hey, he's just talking with a friend on the phone about the fact that he lives near this beautiful canal and he's smoking a cigarette and it's nighttime and it looks like it's raining out and it's just a quiet moment. It's just a quiet moment in his life from his apartment. Oh, look, he's talking with his mother, I see here in the description. If you like comics at all, this is a guy who I seriously um, think you could, could and should follow. Here's another artist drawing him. Look at how beautiful that is, right? And you get to see different visual interpretations Here's Gene Ha drawing this guy. Gene Ha, if you don't know, is a very famous and successful uh, illustrator for Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, all those companies. He got Gene Ha to draw, drawn by the living legend, right? So he's obviously excited. Um, 
this guy's awesome, Chad in Amsterdam. And once again, the title doesn't need to be innovative. It's Adventures of Chad in Amsterdam. And I'm not denigrating his title. I simply mean you don't have to come up with some snappy title even. Look, it's just stories. I could write a book called I Live in Hoboken now. I could write a book called Tony in Hoboken. Oh, those are pins, I see. But you know what I mean? It's like, look at the hold on, look at this story. Look at how simple that art is. And look, he's doing the uh the accent of the character. He's doing the accent of the character. We told bikes from all over the shitty to here. They are housed by what part of the shitty they come from, right? So isn't that, he's using another great uh, storytelling technique, which is that if your character speaks in an accent, you can spell it out phonetically. And look, this is a good comedic moment. Over there, oost over there, west there, here's the centrum. It's four panels, I'm just doing the voices here, but it's four panels in a row of just a guy going, look over there and over there, some other stuff and look over there and there's some other stuff over there. And there's this, like, that's freaking hilarious. And it's genius. And it's not just funny. It's also real. You know, people talk and people talk like that. And one of the greatest lessons that I take from that is sometimes stories can just be simple, realistic, everyday stuff. Like, look at this, just a conversation. Your comic can be anything. It can be goofy. It can be crazy. There's another artist, Siobhan Gallagher. Now she's a big New Yorker cartoonist. She does all this stuff. Look at this. I look at her stuff every day. She's a genius. Depression bear. It's the Care Bears. It's not even a sequential comic. It doesn't need to be. It's just a funny, you know. This is a, this is a story in one image. We should totally hang out sometime. Definitely. The end. They're never going to hang out. They both know it. It's that funny thing where your friends, you know, everyone's busy and it's hard. And, you know, sometimes all the plans you try to make with friends don't always materialize unless you really go out of your way to, you know. Um, but how funny is that? You know, they're doing yoga and they're talking about dating. Your comic can be anything. She did fan art about the, the Schitt's Creek actress, Moira on Schitt's Creek, if you know the, the, the sitcom, the comedy Schitt's Creek. She just loved that character. So she decided to draw her, just like I love that restaurant. And I decided to draw it. She wanted to draw the Josie and the Pussycats movie. Like, it's literally just, it's your playground, you know? Um, if you're someone who likes to draw, drawing is fun making comics, it should be fun. Musicians make rock and roll or music because it's fun for them. Actors act because it's fun. Athletes play sports because they love it. And yes, that is an amazing point. Is that you, Frank, who made the point about XKCD? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, XKCD, it is literally stick figures. I know that comic, right? It's all about the writing. And as you correctly say, Frank, it's about how he conveys his message. Well, so we are just about at the end of time. <laughs> awesome. Good. I mean, any yeah. other questions, thoughts? Shut me up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, just, I love comics, questions? so I'm just, you know, I'm very passionate about it. So. Uh... Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much. This has been an incredible session. Uh, and Thank I think people you. have really enjoyed what you've been able to share with all of us. Thanks. Uh, well, I hope uh, some of you or any of you uh, draw and make comics. Please do. I mean, you know, but it's just fun. It's just something that is fun. And once again, put your comic on a blog and then say, you know, put, throw the link around. Hey, I made a comic. It's on a blog. Check it out. You never know who and it will reach. If a dummy there are a lot like of me, very supportive people online. Yeah, if a dummy like me can get into the New York Times, my God, anything's possible. You know what I mean? I'm just a dude who made comics. All right, are we, are we all over the time limit? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but that's fine. Okay, sorry.
Nope, that's great. So thank you again very much. Uh, and thank you for everybody who joined us here for our virtual uh, MakeFest here at the Ferguson Library. We have one more event going on tonight. Uh, we have the Jackbox Party Online, which will be on the Ferguson Library YouTube channel. Let me change over to this and just so you can kind of see our schedule coming up. There we go. So you can see it's going to be online. Uh, I don't have the link here. It's going to be at um, uh, there we go, uh, at youtube.com slash C slash the Ferguson Library at 6 p.m. Just bring along your phone or tablet and you'll be able to participate in a whole series of games. We'll be running until 8. Mm. Thanks again for everybody who attended. I hope to see you tonight. And once again, thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. And